scripture apologetics comes from the Greek word uh, apologia, and we find that in the New Testament in several places, and it means to give a defense like an attorney is going to give a defense in a courtroom. That's what it means. Um, In 1 Peter 3, uh, Peter commands the church to be able to give a defense uh, for the reasons for the hope that is in you. So that's like the apologist battle battle cry. Um, Everybody ought to learn apologetics because Peter said so, right? Um, and then a more negative example is Paul in the book of Romans. Uh, for the first several chapters, he's uh, laying into everybody, right? That everybody is wicked. Um, pagans, Jews, you think you're special, but you're not. You're wicked too. Um, and uh, maybe in the third chapter, uh, he says that um, these pagans, well, actually, the existence of God has been made clear to them, and they have suppressed that truth. So they are without an excuse, and that's the same word, apologia. They're without a defense. When they stand in front of God, they're not going to be able to give a defense. Now, in our context, um, apologetics is going to have to do with uh, when you're talking to people about Jesus. Right? If you're a Christian, you're also an evangelist. And if you're an evangelist, you're also an apologist, whether you know it or not. Um, so as a Christian, you don't really get a choice as to whether you're going to be an apologist, just whether you're going to do it well. Okay? Um, so with that in mind, uh, we're going to see if we can... M- give a defense for something today using the writings of Luke. Uh, And that would be the Gospel of Luke, and the second part of that is the book of Acts. Um, So if you're a Christian, you probably have a Bible. That Bible is important to you. And in that Bible, probably something that's very important to you is the New Testament, and something very special in that New Testament are the Gospels. Those are as close as you're ever going to get to spending personal time with the Lord. Right? That's where you're going to learn about him, what he had to say, what he did, how he was as a man. Um, and so the reason you're that way is probably, whether you know it or not, you hold to a traditional view of how you got the Gospels. Um, and the traditional view says that uh, they started with the life and teachings of Jesus. Uh, after his death, they were carried on by his followers uh, and their companions, right? And then uh, they wrote those things down accurately. They wrote what Jesus said and did down accurately, um, and then the church has faithfully preserved those texts uh, ever since. That is what, for tonight's purposes, that is what we're going to call the traditional view of how we got the Gospels. Um, So the next thing I'm going to do is hopefully scare you a little bit, or a lot of it. Um, I don't want to scare you like uh, when you see a stick and you think it's a snake, or like when you don't have your phone in your pocket. I'm more thinking of like the morning you woke up on 9-11 and you turned the TV on. Right, so my aim is to instill some dread in you today um, because a lot of New Testament scholars are not Christians. So we have to ask ourselves, why why is that? Why are there people who spend their entire lives studying the New Testament uh, that aren't like magically converted to Christianity? Um, And the reason is they have another theory about how you got those Gospels. And their theory goes something like this. Uh, There were people spreading folklore about a man named Jesus. And there was a historical nugget of truth in there. But as it was spread, sort of like the telephone game, um, if you've never played the telephone game, the telephone game is when a teacher tells the first student in the class a very simple sentence. Right? It's usually no more than 10 words. Um, and then th- that kid whispers it to the next kid. And on and on and on and on and on and on. All the way to the end of the class, the last kid will usually stand up and say something that's completely different from what the first kid said. Um, so that's the, that's the idea. This folklore was transmitted like the telephone game. Um, and then, uh, way later, later in the first century, these Gospels were finally written down, but without any names or titles on them. They were just stories written down. Okay? And then, at the end of the first century, the titles were added. The titles were added because uh, the church had lost the apostles. They're all dead now. And they needed something with authority in the church to govern the church. Well, what's better than the text that we have, right? So they put these important people's names on the text. Um, and the church is not so concerned about um, historical truth as they are, say, embodying these spiritual truths. So that is uh, a popular view in New Testament scholarship. This is how the Gospels were formed. And when we have two theories, uh, what we have to do is look at the evidence, right? And so for tonight's purposes... How I'm going to define evidence is uh, information that makes a theory more or less likely. Okay? We have two theories. We have a traditional theory, how we got the Gospels, and we have 
the uh, skeptical view of how we got the Gospels. And tonight we're going to focus on Luke, because that's the series we're doing, is in Acts. So we're going to focus on things that Luke wrote. And what can we learn, as far as evidence is concerned, from uh, things that Luke, uh, Luke wrote? So uh, we're going to do that by looking at four things that uh, point to uh, evidence. We're going to ask, what does Luke's intro have to say? Um, we're going to ask, does Luke record facts well? We're going to ask, does his, do his writings align well with other documents in the New Testament, things that Paul wrote, right, things that John wrote? Um, and we're going to ask, uh, does it align well with, uh, with historians from the first century? All right. And we're going to see what theory does the evidence support. Um, so first we're going to start in Luke 1. This is how Luke uh, opens up his gospel. You don't have to go there because I'm going to be jumping. There's going to be a lot of jumping. We're not going to spend a lot of, we're, it's not going to be like uh, Pastor Ted stepping you through Acts 1. Acts 1. I'm going to have to bounce uh, to make this case. So you can, but you're going to be moving. Um, and I have them all like printed out already. So I'm not going to be jumping. Um, but let's read how Luke opens his first letter. Luke wrote uh, Luke and Acts. Many have undertaken to compile a narrative about the events that have been fulfilled among us, just as the original eyewitnesses and servants of the word handed them down to us. So it also seemed good to me, since I have carefully investigated everything from the very first, to write to you in an orderly sequence, most honorable Theophilus, so that you may know the certainty of the things about which you have been instructed. I'm reading from the CSB. It might be a little different than what you're reading. But uh, so what do we learn about Luke's intro? What do we learn about Luke's intro? The first thing we learn is that there are already gospels written before Luke puts pen to paper. Right? He says, many have compiled a narrative. And then he calls those people eyewitnesses. Uh, and we have to ask ourselves, uh, what does that sound like? Does that sound like folklore? Or does that sound like uh, eyewitnesses and companions of Jesus writing things down? Um, he also says uh, that he's um, writing an accurate, orderly account. He claims that he's been following things since the beginning. right? And he's compiling a narrative, an orderly narrative. So again, we have to ask ourselves, what does it sound like? Does it sound like folklore, or does it sound like um, maybe an eyewitness's companion? That's who we, that's who we as th take the traditional view of who Luke is. Right? Um, it's also not anonymous. He, it's a letter to a man named Theophilus. Um, have you guys ever sent an important message and not let the person you sent it know who you are? They know each other. Uh, Luke says that he knows... Uh, that this guy has been instructed about some things in Christianity, and he's clarifying things. That's why he's writing the letter. So you can know the things for certain, right? Um, so uh, next we'll go to Acts 1, uh, which is his opening, obviously, in Acts. And it's just, uh, just to let us know that he's carrying on the same narrative. I wrote the first narrative, Theophilus, so it's a letter to the same person, um, about all that Jesus began to do and teach. So all we need is Acts 1 from there to see that this is the sequel, right? He wrote the first, this is the sequel. So all of the points from the first letter carry on to the second letter. Um, so from Luke's intro, we can ask what kind of evidence or what does this evidence support? Which theory does it support? Um, it doesn't seem at all to support the, the skeptical theory. Uh, the, next, uh, the next point we're going to make is that Luke accurately records facts throughout his writings. And what I mean by that is... Uh, you can ask the question, is he describing the region well, the customs well, the people well? Um, and that's going to lend evidence one way or the other, right? Is it a folklore that was developed way later, uh, maybe even far away from where the events supposedly took place, or uh, was it written soon after in the, in the right place at the right time? So um, what we find in, uh, in Luke is that he knows the region very well. Very well. And then um, he knows, for example, he knows that there are two routes from Galilee to Judea, down to Jerusalem. Um, in Luke 9, he records that Jesus sent people ahead of him uh, through Samaria. This is the hilly route down. They have to go through Samaria to get to Jerusalem. And he says that they were actually turned back by the Samaritans. They would not let them pass. Uh, we also find this in uh, the first century Jewish historian, Josephus, where he says that sometimes they would kill Jews coming from Galilee to Jerusalem when they were trying to get there for Passover. Um, we know just from the Gospels that they had a bad relationship, Samaritans and Jews. Um, but we also find 
uh, like I said, from first century historians that this was the case. They hated each other. They hated each other. And if, if you uh, look into the history at all, a couple hundred years before Christ, um, when uh, the Jews came under persecution from Rome for one of the first times, uh, or no, it's actually Greece. When they come under persecution from Greece for the first time, uh, the Samaritans, who were Jewish at the time, distanced themselves, right? And they, they removed themselves from Jerusalem, and they said, we're not those people. We'll, we'll even name our temple after Zeus. So if you want to know why Samaritans and Jews don't get along, that's why. Because Jews saw them as abandoning ship when times got hard, and Samaritans saw them as uh, radicals, like uh, radical religious people. Um, so, uh, but, he, but he mentions this, that, that Jesus and his companions try to come down through Samaria and can't go. So then they come down... Uh, the Jordan River Valley. In Luke 19, uh, Jesus, is in, uh, as Jesus is recorded to approach Jerusalem from the east uh, through the Mount of Olives, through the town of Bethany and Bethphage. Um, that's from the east. He had to come down the Jordan River Valley and then cut east to Jerusalem. Those are the only two ways to get down. Um, now, this doesn't prove Luke is telling the truth. What it proves is that Luke knows what he's talking about, right? Um, and we can compare this to what we call the false, false gospels. Um, if you've never heard of the false gospels, um, they are gospels that get trotted out like every Christmas or Easter. Um, maybe Times Magazine or 60 Minutes or someone will say something like these forbidden gospels where the real Jesus is at. Um, the church doesn't want you to see. I'm a member of the church, and I'm telling you, you can read them if you want. Uh, the reason, they've never been taken seriously in the church, uh, never been referenced as authoritative, is because... They were written in the second century. Uh, they showed up on the scene in the second, third, fourth, fifth century, and the church said, where did these come from? Right. And so that's why they've never been taken seriously. So you can watch the Da Vinci Code uh, for entertainment value if you want, but just know that it's, it's fiction. It's just made up. Um, the church never took them seriously because they didn't have this unbroken chain handed down from them. Uh, uh, most of the church fathers can be traced like only a couple degrees removed from an apostle, right? So uh, when they saw a new document come, they just went, what is this? Where did it come from? And if it didn't match up, they just disregarded it. Um, but those are the false gospels. And when we compare them, uh, they mention almost no locations. In all uh, half a dozen or so from the second century, uh, only four places are ever mentioned. Jerusalem, Nazareth, Judea, and the Jordan River. Those are the four locations ever mentioned. In those Gospels, um, they seem to be written by someone who didn't know the region, who's from far away and just knew some big names. It'd be like someone from the other side of the world mentioning New York City to try to convince you that they were from America. Um, uh, another clue is the names in the Gospels, especially Luke, uh, line up well with the names of the time and, and region. Uh, there's a Christian scholar named uh, Richard Bauckham who embarked on a research project where he basically counted all the names of the bone boxes in Jerusalem that line up to the first century, or Judea, actually, the whole area of Judea. And what he found was um, all of the popularity of the names at the time line up with uh, the Gospels very well. And this is something you can't do on accident, right? You can't do, if, you, if you're not from a region, you can't get all the names correct. And what I mean by that is, for example, the first name on the list, the most popular name uh, in the region, was Simon. Now, every time you see Simon used in Luke or any gospel, you will see a clarifier added to it. Simon, son of so-and-so. Simon, from this place. Simon, the fisherman. Simon, right? Um, and the reason is, it'd be like saying Mike today, right? I like that Mike guy. I was like, Mike, Mike who? Yeah. <laughs> uh, it, it's just a popular name. It's too popular to not add a clarifier. You can't just say, P you can't just say Simon. Simon Peter is another one. Um, you have to add something to it to make sense. Uh, and you can kind of guess what the most popular women's name is at the time because there are so many Marys in the gospel. Um, and if you want a homework assignment, you can go find all the clarifiers added to the Marys that, that come and go. But that's the number one female name too. And you can't accidentally do this. You can't accidentally line up all the popular names and unpopular names. And what we find in the Gospels is that all the popular names like Peter and Mary and even Jesus, uh, that, uh, Yeshua was a popular name at the time, they all have clarifiers. When people talk about Jesus, maybe not when um, the writer's talking about him because they'll just call him Lord, but when other people talk about Jesus, they almost always say Jesus of Nazareth, right? They almost always say that. And the reason they have to do that is because it's a popular name at the time. Um, Luke gets the title of government officials, names and titles of government officials right, over and over again. 
Um, and even down to the point where he's naming uh, regional titles that aren't used anywhere else. Uh, he names uh, Galio uh, as a proconsul of Achaia. This has been uh, only in the last couple hundred years, like proven through archaeology, that that guy was the proconsul in 51 AD uh, in, in that region. Um, but he also names uh, Praetors in Philippi, which is a unique title to, to Philippi. Um, he names a man named Publius, uh, the first man of the island of Malta. And for a long time, skeptical scholars thought Luke just made that up, that he was just the guy in charge of the island, and he called him the first man. But um, in the 1800s, they found an inscription calling someone else uh, the first man of the island of Malta. That was that the actual official title of the man was the first man of the island, the man in charge. So um, Luke has proven again and again to be historically reliable, that he is trying to get all of his details right. Uh, down to the point where, uh, you know, and these are just kind of redundant after a while, but Asiarchs in Ephesus, that's another local region, or regional um, title, and Thessalonica City Council, he calls Politarchs, and that is only used in Thessalonica. So again and again, this shows that he was in the right place at the right time, that he was exactly where he needed to be um, to record the facts. Uh, Luke names 32 countries, 54 cities, nine islands without making one error. Uh, so it's hard to say that this is written a long time later by someone not associated with the facts. Um, and another, another uh, point of evidence, in the book of Acts, as you guys go through, pay attention to the pronouns, and you will see him shift from the third person, Paul, 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 they, 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 and you will see him shift, and he'll say we, right? These are the we passages in Acts, is what we call them. This is when Luke was there. And you'll notice that those passages have the most detail, because Luke is only relying on his own memory at that point, right? We, 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 we. That's chapter 16, 20, 21, 27, and 28 when the book ends, uh, are we passages. And again, you'll see more and more details in the we passages than anywhere else. And that's because he had firsthand encounter with whatever he's, whatever he's recording at the time. So we have to ask, uh, does Luke accurately record facts? And, and I could, this is not going to be exhaustive. You can kind of keep going with these. Um, but j just with that bit of evidence, that the answer seems to be yes, and uh, does that evidence support uh, the skeptical theory or the traditional theory of how the Gospels were formed? Um, Luke aligns well with other New Testament writers, and so what we're going to say here is that he doesn't contradict other New Testament writers. One doesn't say A, and Luke says not A, and uh, we're going to find uh, undesigned coincidences. And what I mean by undesigned coincidences is when an author casually uh, answers a question that's raised in another text. And we're going we're to look at a few examples of these. In Luke chapter 6, or I mean in John chapter 6, uh, Jesus turns to Philip and asks Philip, where do we buy bread? This is at the, the feeding of the 5,000. Luke turns to Philip, who Philip is like a, uh, the kids call it like an NPC, right? Uh, non-playable character. He's just a background character in the Gospels. This is one of the only times he ever gets talked to, right? Um, and he asks him, where can we buy bread? Uh, there's no reason given in John why he asked Philip. Uh, so it's kind of strange. Um, but it's not, it's, not, it's not too crazy. Obviously, he's one of the disciples. He had to ask somebody. But if we go to Luke chapter 9, Luke chapter 9 lets us know something about the feeding of the 5,000 that the other Gospels don't. Luke tells us the feeding of the 5,000 happened outside of Bethsaida. Now, if we go back to John, in his opening, when he's laying out where everyone came from, he, he passingly mentions Philip, who was from Bethsaida. Jesus turned to Philip because he's from the town. But we can only put those two together uh, by going from one gospel to Luke's gospel, and they're clarifying one another, right? Um, and these are what we call undesigned coincidences. They're things that only happen when two people are telling the truth. It only happened when two people are recording things that they remember. Uh, in Romans 16, uh, Paul, you know, at the end of Romans, um, everyone's really tired of doing Romans, and we get to uh, the greetings, and most people just don't read the rest of it. Right? You just skip the rest of it. But Paul greets two people named Priscilla and Aquila, and he calls them a few things that are unique. He says they're co-workers with me. He says they, uh, they risk their lives for me, and that the Gentile churches, not only me, but the Gentile churches should be thankful for them. And those are three really unique things, and we'd like to know why. Why does Paul specifically uh, thank them for that? And in Luke's writings, in Acts chapter 18, we find out, uh, i pick up at the beginning. After this, he left Athens and went to Corinth, that's Paul, uh, where he found a Jew named Aquila, a native of Pontus. 
who had recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because Claudius had ordered all the Jews to leave Rome. And the rest of the chapter talks about uh, Paul working with them because they were also tent makers. That was how he had to make a living while he was there. Um, it also talks about how many Gentiles were converted. Paul's preaching in the synagogue. He gets no converts. He gets kicked out, right? So he says, I'm turning to the Gentiles now. And he starts baptizing Gentiles like crazy. Um, and, he also, and it also records that the Jews united against them and persecuted them. So we go back to Romans. Um, and Paul is thanking them for being co-workers with him. They were making tents with him. Um, that, uh, that they risked their necks for him. They were all being persecuted by the Jews, and that the Gentiles ought to tell them thank you, right? Because they spread the news amongst the Gentiles. Again, this is another undesigned coincidence where um, these, two set, these two texts support each other. Um, so in Acts, uh, yeah, in Acts chapter 18 and verse 5, so picking up not too long after that, after it says Priscilla and Aquila were working with him, it mentions that they worked with him for six days a week, and he preached in the synagogues uh, on the Sabbath. Um, and then, uh, so... Pick it up in four. He reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath and tried to persuade both Jews and Greeks. When Silas and Timothy arrived in Macedonia, Paul devoted himself to preaching the word and testified to the Jews that Jesus uh, is the Messiah. So we can ask the question, why was he working for six days a week until they showed up? Well, if we look at Paul's second letter to the Corinthians, he shines some light on the situation. He says, uh, or did I commit a sin by humbling myself so that you might be exalted? Because I preached the gospel of God to you free of charge. I robbed other churches by taking pay from them to minister to you. When I was present with you and in need, I did not burden anyone. Paul's saying that he needed something, but he worked when he needed something, right? Um, and he basically took money from other churches to support himself. Well, how did he do that? He says, since the brothers who came from Macedonia supplied my needs. When they showed up, they brought money from other churches to help take care of Paul. So Paul could, could stop building tents and start preaching all day, every day. Right? And we only get the whole picture when we take one thing from Luke and one thing from Paul himself. So uh, you know, that's another example of how uh, the New Testament documents fit really well with Luke. So we're using Luke to try to determine which of these theories is correct. Um, and the last, the, the last other New Testament document we have um, that lines, it's not the last one. There's a, there are dozens and dozens of these uh, undesigned coincidences. And um, books have been spilled. And there are references uh, at the bottom of your notes, if you have notes uh, for books and you know, YouTube videos, even if you wanted, you know, depending on what you're, what you're into, um, where you can look at how these uh, documents in the New Testament line up uh, too perfectly to be uh, made up. But um, in 1 Timothy, a letter written from Paul, in chapter 5, he writes this, The elders who are good leaders and are, are to be considered worthy of double honor, especially those who work hard at preaching and teaching. For the scripture says, Do not muzzle an ox while it is treading out the grain. That's from Deuteronomy. He just, he just quoted Deuteronomy 25. And the worker is worthy of his wages. Now, you can search the whole Bible. You will only find that phrase uttered one time from the Lord himself in the Gospel of Luke. So Paul here is affirming Luke's writings as scripture. He says, I'm quoting scripture, and then he quotes Luke, right? So again, we have these, uh, su this uh, document supporting each other. So we have to ask ourselves, which theory is better supported um, by documents that aren't contradicting each other, but are supporting each other um, and telling the same stories from different perspectives? Uh, and it seems to me, obviously, that uh, the traditional view is supported by that theory better. Um, the next thing is, Luke is very well supported by other first century historians. Luke is considered to be a first century historian because he is trying to tell the history of how the church got to where it is. So when we compare him to other first century historians, uh, we, we get a lot, a lot of alignment with what he has to say. Um, Roman historian uh, Suetonius uh, recorded the expulsion of the Jews that we talked about earlier. Priscilla and Aquila get kicked out of Rome. That's why Paul even meets them. Um, uh, the Roman historian Suetonius records that, that Claudius kicked them all out. And he also records that after Claudius died, uh, Nero hated Claudius' guts so bad that he just rescinded all of his decrees. So that's when um, Priscilla and Aquila come back to Rome. That's why when he writes Romans, Paul writes Romans, they're there. He says, greet them, you know, tell them hi for me, and make sure to tell them thankful, uh, thank you for the you know, Gentile churches. Um, 
So uh, that's one alignment with uh, Suetonius. Um, Tacitus is like uh, the best Roman historian we have from the uh, late 1st, early 2nd century. And Tac Tacitus says that uh, uh, Jesus was put to death under Tiberius by Pontius Pilate. And, uh, you know, for our purposes tonight, that's in Luke 23. Uh, that, Christi uh, that Christianity began in Judea. That happens in Acts 2. That's the day of Pentecost, probably what Pastor Ted's going to go over here pretty soon. Um, that Christ was the source of the name for Christians, but it was given to the Christians by other people. Other people started calling them Christians. And we actually find that in Acts chapter 11, um, that Christians were persecuted by, for their faith. That's basically the whole book of Acts. Um, and that uh, there were a large presence of Christians in Rome. So Suetonius says all this. Suetonius has never read Acts, by the way. He's just recording what he knows about what, what's happened in Rome, or at least the empire, uh, over the last century. So in Acts 28, when Paul and Luke and all their companions show up to Rome, they're greeted by the church there. There's already a, a presence there. So um, Suetonius and Tacitus and uh, the Jewish first century uh, historian named Josephus uh, all really, uh, line up really well. All line up really well. And again, uh, what, uh, which theory does that support? Which theory does that support? That there was a folklore that slowly spread over time and some people a long time later made up a story, or does it support the traditional view of how Scripture was formed? Um, now, a skeptic might come back and say, well, Luke can't even keep his own story straight. He, had, he is hopelessly contradictory. Um, so even if he did get some things right, it's obvious he was making something up because he, he messes up on Paul's conversion. Probably one of the most important parts of the book of Acts, he messes it up. In Acts chapter 9, when Luke records, uh, re records his uh, conversion, Luke says uh, that his companions heard a sound but saw no one. And later in the book of Acts, in Acts 22, Paul is retelling his own conversion. And Paul says that his companions saw a light but couldn't hear the voice. So they are hopelessly contradictory, and you might as well abandon ship on thinking that Luke was any good at telling the truth. Um, so I think if we put on some critical thinking lenses and examine that argument, that we can see that they're not actually contradictory. Um, for example, when I was in the Navy, we had a deterrent on the boat uh, that we didn't ever, I don't think, maybe use like twice. But it was called the long-range acoustic device. And that was just a really loud, focused speaker that we could point at a boat that was coming towards our boat, and tell them, turn around really loud, then we made sure they, you know, they could hear it. Now, being a 20-year-old up to no good ends, you know, um, we obviously pointed that at each other at way less, way less range than you're supposed to ever use that thing, right? And at the same time, two things happen. You can hear something, and you have no idea what it is, right? Uh, if someone spoke through that speaker, because you could actually speak through it and say whatever you wanted. Uh, you're supposed to say something really official, like turn to bearing, whatever. But obviously, when we're 20-year-olds, we're not saying anything official. But when we're talking to each other too close, and the guy's like falling down because it's so loud, he can't tell you what you just said on that speaker, right? He can't. But he, he heard something. Whatever that racket was, he heard it. And if you need an example, I'm sure we can turn the volume up really loud in here until you can hear me but not hear me anymore, right? Um, and the second point is, the, the, it said they saw a light, and they saw no person. If you've ever seen someone at night with a flashlight, you know exactly how that could work, right? If, if you've ever seen a light, someone carrying a light so bright that you can't see them, I, I think we can say that this contradiction is not all it, it, that it's, uh, you know, cracked up to be. And so this is going to lead to a big question. Why in the world do they hold to this theory? Why in the world do they hold to this theory that doesn't seem to be supported by any of the evidence we've went over so far? I'm going to answer that for you. Um, usually you have to do a little digging because a lot of times it's just assumed that the Gospels are really late. But sometimes they'll tell you why they think that is. And the reason they think that is, is because in the Gospels, Jesus predicts something that hasn't happened yet. He predicts, in all the Gospels, the destruction of the temple. Right? And if you know when that happened, uh, that happened in the year 70 AD. The temple was destroyed by the Romans in the year 70 AD. And so the reasoning goes, he could not have predicted that because people can't tell the future. The Gospels had to be written after 70 AD because people can't tell the future. And the Gospel writers were trying to make him look like something he wasn't. They were trying to make him look divine. So the Gospels had to be written after 70 AD. Now you run the theory backwards. 
That's how it happens. They have this reason. They are, it's going to boil down to they are committed to their atheism. Right? They are committed to their natural worldview. So if you can't tell the future, it had to happen after the temple was destroyed. So the first gospel can't be written until 75, right? sometime after the destruction of the temple. Um, now, this is pretty telling, right? That the main, almost the only reason you'll ever see cited is this. Uh, and it's, if it's not the only, it's the main. Um, but this runs into problems. Uh, first off, Luke never says that this was fulfilled. No gospel writer says this happened. Uh, and the reason that's important is, look how careful Luke is in recording prophecies. Uh, this is from Acts chapter 11. Now in these days, prophets came down from Jerusalem to Antioch, and one of them named Agabus stood up and foretold by the Spirit that there would be a great famine over all the world. And this took place in the days of Claudius. If you blinked while someone else was reading the Bible to you or while you were nodding off reading this, you could be forgiven and never seeing Agabus in the Bible. Agabus comes and goes in one verse. It's, it's a, it, 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 they don't come back right after that and, and solve a, lot, like a, a bunch of problems for Christianity. Um, so Agabus, this unknown someone, tells a prophecy, and Luke writes it down and tells you when it happened. Right? If Luke is that careful with Agabus, why in the world would he not take the time to write down, and this happened in the days of Nero, or this happened uh, in the days of so-and-so, right? When it comes to what the Lord, did, what the Lord said, the Lord, right? Um, so it doesn't seem likely that he would not say, oh, and by the way, this happened in, you know, 70 AD. Uh, but, th and that's, that's one argument against it. Another one is, Jesus also adds a bunch of caveats uh, that don't end up happening. He says, hope it's not in the winter. Well, we learn from the Roman, or for the Jewish historian, Josephus, who was there, he was the leader of the, of the Jerusalem army when it happened, he says it happened in the summer. So why would you add that caveat if you're writing it after the fact to make Jesus look cool, right? Um, another one he says is, uh, uh, don't enter the city. Josephus says they destroyed the city. There was no city to come into. Um, and then he says, make sure, or hope it doesn't happen on the Sabbath. Why is Jesus adding all these caveats that, that didn't end up happening if you're, trying, if you're just trying to make him look cool? If it's just what Jesus said, that makes sense, right? This is just what he said. You better hope it's not in the winter because it's going to be cold. You're going to be running, right? Um, but uh, if you're making it up after the fact, wh wh what are all those for, you know? That, that doesn't make sense. But the really knockdown argument against this is the end of the book of Acts. Now, Luke, if he's careful about prophecy, he's even more careful about the martyrdom of faithful Christians. Um, in Acts chapter 7, he records Stephen's martyrdom. Um, in chapter 12, he records James, the brother of John's martyrdom. And these are faithful Christians that he mentions are, are killed for their faith. Um, what's, uh, what's missing is the three most important Christians in the first century. At the end of, Ac uh, of Acts 28, Paul is still alive, Peter is still alive, and James, the brother of Jesus, are still alive. There's no mention of them being dead. Now, if I was to ask you to write the person sitting next to you, if you have someone sitting next to you, um, it, the closest person to you. If I was to ask you to write anyone's biography in this room, there's one thing I know you can't write about, and that's their death. Why? Because it hasn't happened yet, right? Um, so why does Luke end his, uh, his story with Paul arriving in Rome and the three biggest Christians in the world still alive? Because at the present time when he was writing the document, they were still alive, right? That seems the most likely explanation. And so when did they die, is the question we can ask. Well, Peter and Paul uh, were killed by Nero in the early 60s. Uh, we know that from three church fathers, uh, Origen, Eusebius, and Clement, all write that Peter and Paul were killed in Rome uh, by the emperor Nero. Um, and Josephus, again, the Jewish historian, records that James, the brother of Jesus, around the same time, was thrown off the top of the temple in Jerusalem. So if these three people all died in the early 60s, why in the world would we commit ourselves to a date after the early 60s? So if the, if, if the book of Acts had to have been written in the early 60s, the Gospel of Luke had to be written earlier than that. The Gospel of Luke 
according to his own words, is not the first gospel. Remember, he says others have uh, undertaken to compile a narrative. So church tradition says Matthew and Mark wrote before him. Um, so Matthew and Mark had to be before that. So we're talking 40s or 50s. Right? There's only a couple, 30s, 40s, 50s. Those are, those are our options at this point. Um, so uh, with that in mind, I think, I think it's safe to say the skeptical theory is not a good theory. It's not a good theory. Um, and what you have to do is basically dismiss all the evidence and be committed to the idea that God can't exist. And Jesus could not be God, so he couldn't have been telling the future. Because that's what their argument rests on. Um, and so some other, uh, you know, we're almost done, but some, some other arguments against, um, against this theory are, uh, well, one, it says there are these anonymous gospels. And the problem with that theory is we don't have one. Of all the oldest documents we have, they all have titles. Not only do they have titles, they all have the right titles. That's a, that's a pretty big problem with the theory. You have, if you have no reason to, to hold it other than, uh, you know, speculation. Um, and so I, I, I don't want to make it seem like we have, like, first century copies. Most of the copies of the Gospels we have are from the second and third. Those are, like, the oldest stuff we have, the second and third century. But all of them have titles. All of them have the correct titles. So you have to ask yourself, if the church at the time is from Turkey to Africa to Europe, that's how far the church has spread, how in the world did they flip a switch and all decide to put the same titles on the same documents at the same time? That's a miracle, right? Um, and so we can compare it to the book of Hebrews, right? The letter to the Hebrews. Um, and what we see is the church fathers all agree on who wrote the Gospels. We can't find any of them arguing about who wrote the Gospels. There's no dispute. But they are all arguing about who wrote Hebrews because we don't know who wrote it. And today we don't know who wrote it. Some people say Luke. You know, Paul, Paul, Paulus, you know, there's all kinds of theories. It doesn't matter. Um, but they were the same way. They were arguing about it all the time, but they didn't argue about the Gospels. Um, so, where are we at? Where are we at? Uh, the last point is, if you are doing what the skeptical theory says you're doing, you're putting names on the documents to make them authoritative. Why in the world do you pick Mark? and Luke. If I was to take their names off of their Gospels, you could probably read the New Testament without noticing them. Because they're not apostles. They're not eyewitnesses. So if you were going to make up names, wouldn't you put Peter? Wouldn't you put James? Or uh, even Mary. Mary Magdalene makes more sense if you're making something up to, uh, to say that this, you know, because they're eyewitnesses. If you want some a document to have authority, you're going to want it to be as close to Jesus as possible. And that's exactly what you see when you look at those false gospels that we talked about earlier that are written in the second and third century. Um, you see uh, Thomas, Peter, Mary. Th this is what they name them after because they're trying to make them look legitimate. Um, but doesn't it make more sense to say their names are on it because they wrote it? Right? Their names are on it because they wrote it. And even if they weren't eyewitnesses, they were as close as we had in the first century. Luke is the companion of Paul. And, he, and if you follow the we passages... He comes into contact with uh, other apostles at the time. It makes sense that he would be the one to try to put together a whole picture from everybody, what everybody told him, right? Um, and Mark uh, is the companion of Peter. And so that's why many people think that Mark is basically Peter's gospel, that Mark followed Peter and organized his sermons and, and wrote down what Peter had to say. So that's the traditional view. Where, where does the evidence point us? Um, I think all of the evidence is in favor of the traditional view, uh, and then, so you have to rest on uh, something other than evidence to hold the uh, to hold the skeptical view. Um, so, uh, after doing my best to scare you uh, at the beginning, I don't know if anybody actually got scared, but uh, after doing my best to scare you at the beginning, I hope you kind of sleep easy tonight, knowing that the traditional view makes more sense of the data that we have, um, and uh, that the skeptical view is kind of like a sitting on the sinking sand of speculation. You know, if you start with, I'm committed to my atheism, so I have to, I have to come up with a theory, and it's almost all speculation. Um, and then the traditional view seems to be sort of standing on the firm ground of the evidence, right? So um, I hope you have a copy of the notes, you know, uh, and you can kind of go over that, especially those undesigned coincidences, flip back and forth and see how they make sense. 
Um, but with that, uh, I guess we'll close in prayer and talk about uh, what we learned tonight.